a multipolar world, there's only two directions. Uh, one is uh, consensus and the other one is conflict. Uh, it, and the U.S., by providing bombs and everything like that, is clearly aiming towards conflict. Uh, China, by doing economic development and putting forward these principles, is looking at uh, how to build consensus. And this is really the two major directions that are out there. Hello, everybody. Here's the second part of the Multipolar Peace Alliance meeting we had the other day. If you haven't seen part one yet, it's linked right here and in the description. It was a long talk with some back and forth about the nature of the financial system and our analysis about what multipolarity will mean concretely as we go forward in this brave new world of the post, post Cold War. Look, the alternative landscape, I guess, started to take a bit of shape, didn't it, with um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, which talked a lot about security, but very much from an internally oriented perspective. What some of those issues are. Um, one of those things, obviously, is around the question of economic payments, and we've got, um, you know, no better a person than Kathleen Tyson um, to give us some thoughts around what that emerging uh, multipolar payments and mercantile system looks like today, and what it's conceivable to look like over, say, the next five to ten years, Kathleen. Right. Um, there's a lot of speculation going on about there's going to be a new payment system, there's going to be a BRICS currency. Um, I'm skeptical of all of that. It's not necessary. And uh, it would actually create a single target for um, Western disruption. Uh, also, it's uh, technically and politically difficult to agree for a payment system that's going to be global to operate under one jurisdiction's laws and rules. And every payment system has to have a jurisdiction. So uh, I, I can't see them all agreeing that they're going to allow any of them, as, as much as they like collaborating within BRICS, um, to have absolute control over jurisdiction of the new payment system. Um, so I actually believe what BRICS tells us and BRICS tells us that they want local currency trade. That you know you can choose any currency you want to do business in. The alternative to the dollar is the dollar and all other currencies. And what they want is for particularly the global East and South to do more trade, and we're talking trade here, um, in each other's currencies. ASEAN has uh, unanimously agreed to this in May of last year and is working towards that, doing more business, um, uh, inter making their payment systems interoperable with each other's banks. That's the right direction ahead. And none of that requires massive innovation or a new treaty um, to get done because the um, China has expanded access to its SIPS payment platform or Yuan, but also has the Hong Kong Yuan which it, um, is doing increasing business out of Hong Kong. Um, and that is consistent with the bank, the way banks operate today. It doesn't require any particular innovation within the banks. Virtually every big bank today is multi-currency. They're used to managing in multiple currencies, multiple ledgers. Um, so to move to local currency trade is just an extension of that trend. And it doesn't have to be dis um, disruptive even to the Western global economy. And the reason for that is that trade is actually an incredibly tiny amount of what moves in global capital markets. All trade and good, everything that moves by rail and ships um, and lorries anywhere in the world totals about $48 trillion annually. 
it's tiny compared to the flows in capital markets where you know bond markets are about i don't know i think about 380 billion um or trillion um uh, equity markets probably about 200 trillion uh derivatives uh if we just even looked at the margin movements in derivatives probably only about 400 trillion um uh secured interbank credit um is about 1900 trillion so 48 trillion as a percentage of that is virtually unnoticeable. So as long as the capital markets of the world stay dollarized and continue doing what they're doing, uh, they probably won't notice when trade in real goods moves into other currencies, even oil. We probably won't notice it. Oil is only 8 trillion of the global, uh, global trade. It's tiny. So if some of that de-dollarizes, we probably just won't notice. And that's, I think, the safest route forward for BRICS is to do things practically, pragmatically, bilaterally, because all trade is agreed bilaterally, and do it in a way that more or less passes by unnoticed. Yeah, we're starting to see a bit of that happening also in Southeast Asia, as you mentioned. And... Um... And I guess my thinking is that a lot of these uh, th these these elements, I guess, of uh, transnational or international interactions can help create the institutional environment that can act as something of a bulwark against the the madness of the war machines, if you will, because there's actually a lot at stake for countries that continue to have primary ambitions around economic development to improve the livelihoods of their peoples. Um, yes. Hussain, I, I wish I sorry, had a government Kathleen. that did that. Um, I, I do want to add, there is some infrastructure that does need building. Um, I actually want to build it. Uh, I, you know, I built the, the global interbank credit markets that are now 18 trillion a day. I wrote the very first tri-party repo. And at the time, we were told the world didn't need it. Banks wouldn't use it, and it's a, it's now a huge interbank daily market. Uh, the The difficulty with the eighty currencies, where governments have made commitment to move to local currency trade, is that there is not interbank liquidity at scale in those eighty currencies. Even yuan, um, yuan global liquidity is mostly provided by ICBC, which now has twelve global clearing centers for yuan. But I I would like to build the solution for those 80 currencies to be as liquid as dollar, yen, euro, sterling, Swiss franc. If anyone wants to introduce a VC for that, I'm open. Well, <laughs> well let's, you need let's more than VC. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty big undertaking, Kathleen. I, I, I have um, a question well, for you. But I, you know, this is what I do. I globalized U.S. dollar. I globalized U.S. treasuries. There's, you know, I, I created the interbank markets. <laughs> a I, uh, Kathleen, that's great. I, I want to ask you a question. I, I was an investment banker. I was in charge of my city's uh, uh, finances and things like this. Um, a, a lot of the movement that you're talking about in terms of liquidity is is not going into what I would call the real economy. It's not, you know, the capital markets are there to exactly. provide not liquidity for banks, but they're supposed to actually do things. You know, companies are supposed to invest and things like that. And instead, what we see is a, is a, a massive casino uh, where uh, entities are just making bets and things like that. So I, I, I would uh, caution uh, about, uh, you know, thinking that somehow... Uh, uh, volume equals progress, uh, and I. But I do agree exactly. with you. There, there There's is a, a kinetic, solution. There is a kinetic economy in real world goods and trade, where you know that forty eight trillion needs to move. Um, and then there is the financialized economy, which has been over leveraged for the last 30, 40 years, yes. um, <laughs> which is heavily dollarized and will continue to be heavily dollarized. Um, I think actually some of yeah, I, I, Kathleen. What happens when uh, people stop buying uh, U.S. Treasuries because there's uh, too many U.S. Treasuries and not enough buyers? I mean, uh, central banks right now are at their lowest point. The only reason that people are buying them is because it's the U.S. and it has high rates. Once those rates go down, 
there's going to be a problem. That's why, um, uh, what's well, your name? Uh, the, yeah. Janet U.S. Treasury. Yeah, when yeah. Yellen was over here, she was asking the Chinese government to put nearly a, you know, a, a trillion dollars into bond sales. It was uh, somewhere around 900 um, million, 900 billion. Uh, it, when she left, uh, the Chinese immediately bought gold. Uh, I think that can tell you something. Well, I watch uh, the Treasury data on foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries very closely. I look at it every single month as soon as it's published. So I'm, I'm very aware of the trends. And China has been um, divesting ever since the first sanctions on China, basically, in, in 2012, 2014. Um, it's, been, it's been diminishing its holdings of U.S. Treasuries. So it's part of a long trend of China de-risking. Um, it's accelerated since the Russian sanctions and the Russian uh, dis expropriations of uh, Russian assets. Uh, and that's just sensible risk management, which the leadership of the People's Bank of China has made clear that just as a matter of risk management, they don't want to be exposed to a creditor that defaults on their debts whenever it gets inconvenient or they don't like anybody. Um, <laughs> Going back but to your original thing building, that the dollar is going to stay there, I'm just wondering how that analysis works with the other analysis. I've got, I've got an analysis. I've got a theory. Um, I'm, it's supported now by data, but at the time it was just a theory that in October 22 at the IMF meetings, Yellen got the rest of the central banks um, in its sort of uh, allies camp to agree to something that's called I call it a daisy chain where they do stealth quantitative easing to create money to buy each other's debt. And if you look at the numbers, it's, it's now clear that it did happen in October 22. They are buying each other's debts. They're booking it as central bank official reserves. And it's, it's, it's allowed them to sustain at least the, the, the um, appearance of liquidity in their bond markets. Well, this will, this and will be fun to, to watch the rollout. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, wonderful I stuff, Jeff. If, if, if you can, stable. if you can send me, uh, I'd be very interested in that and uh, uh, and uh, yeah. making sure that that's published. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, the data is a bit. You you have to be really kind of a data freak about this stuff. Um, uh, it because it, it it shows up in the tick data, yes, but um, it also shows up in the IMF reported uh, quarterly uh, official reserves. Uh, but it doesn't break it. The IMF data does not break it out by central bank, central bank by central bank. So um, I don't have the staff <laughs> or the funding to really do the work that's that uh, that it deserves to show the daisy chain. But it does it does show broadly in the inflections in holdings of official reserves. That's well, got to be happening somewhere, right? So um, now moving off the finance stuff perhaps but uh, i'm not sure who had their hand up first it might have been hussein if it is or if yeah i just wanted to comment on what hussein. yeah what kathleen described in terms of the the volume of financial paper being traded that is a, maybe 100 times more than the real economic uh needs of the world population and einar's uh, uh reaction to that uh, that's the core of the crisis we have today. We have a, a failing bankrupt financial and banking and economic system in the West, which is going down. And we have a rising economic system spearheaded by China, but not only China, but most of Southeast Asia, India, really now Russia, and even the Arab countries and Africa. This dichotomy, this imbalance in the world is the source of a lot of the crises we have today. All this money which is circulating in the financial market is just hot air. It should be all written off because this is the casino. This is not reality. Reality is what China and the others are doing. They're focused on using money as a tool, political tool for physical, economic, social, and cultural development. We are not doing that. Since the financial crisis in 2008, through quantitative easing, the the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the EU Bank, and the Japanese Japan Bank, they produced more than $24 trillion. And where did that go? It did not go to infrastructure. Or it went to speculators, gamblers. China 
since 2008 also produced around 14 to 18 trillion equivalent trillion dollars of credits through the, the, the government banks and other, other financial markets. And that was used exclusively to build infrastructure, industry, scientific and technological projects, including the high-speed rail, which every, is amazing everybody, that was a product of that. So there's a, a philosophical difference in the thinking. We had that in the United States and Europe. In the United States under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he controlled the banks and the banks should work for the people. And they built infrastructure more than what China is doing now comparatively. That's what make America great. That's what made America fight World War II. It was Roosevelt's policy, the New Deal, the infrastructure development projects, the urbanization, electrifying the, the, the countryside. We had the same in Europe, in Sweden. We used state funds, pension funds, to build highways, railways, nuclear power plants. So this was all shifted in the 70s when the Bretton Woods system was. Now, this is where we have the conflict, actually, part of the conflict is that we have the West is going down economically and the rest of the world is going up. And that friction is a source of the conflict we have today. So all this financial paper is a big burden, is a cancer actually on the people of the West, but also it's creating all the problems in the rest. So we need to reform the financial system in the West and go back to financing the real economy that for each dollar, you have to have an equivalent in, the re in reality, not uh, like we have one dollar in production, and then you have billion dollars in financial speculation. Every day in the Swedish financial market, currency is traded for the whole Swedish GDP in a year, in one day. People buying and selling currency using supercomputers for trillions of dollars every day. You know, is that just completely insane? And this is. <laughs> I actually yeah, don't you know, see a last thing. Look, what, so, well, it, it, seems, it does settle 7.5 trillion a day in foreign exchange transactions in just 18 currencies. Um, I was I was the domain lead on that with IBM to build it. Um, so yeah, I, I take responsibility. I did that. Uh, and that's now 1,900 trillion a year in foreign exchange trades. And none of that has to do with anything moving in the real world. Um, so it is entirely just a casino. Look at the um, same set. As, as they say in uh, the movie uh, Wolf of uh, Wall Street, it's all Fugazi. You know, he goes, Fugazi, <laughs> Wazi, Gazi, who yeah. knows? <laughs> so that's what uh, the whole uh, the global economy has uh, become. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, and look, but yeah, it, it seems to me that what what what's happening in the world at the moment. I mean, a lot of the, the the headlines, I guess, revolve around things like NATO and stuff. But there's actually a whole series of underlying structural shifts going on in the way that economies work and how resources are deployed and what the balances are in domestic economies and how that spills over into um, into um, international tensions. Um, Digby, I'm going to jump this one into your direction because um, a couple of days ago, you did a um, a video about some of these things, which I actually ended up, I watched it twice, um, once quickly and then once um, more thoroughly. And I thought it was an absolute tour of the force in the mm -hmm. way that it connected um, what's going on in the, in the, in the economy, if you will, the global structure of the economy as the foundational or bedrock piece to these other elements that we often spend a lot of time talking about. Could you just, if you could, just help us connect and help our viewers connect these dots together a little bit? Yeah, I hope so. I, I, when we talk about really large numbers, you know, many, many trillions of dollars, I think the vast majority of the audience just their eyes glaze over because it just seems incomprehensible um mm. and it's very, very difficult for for people to understand and i've got a phd and i still don't quite get it so uh look the the what i was talking about the other day was the the situation a predicament that the americans have got themselves into which is that um 
with the because they've got the reserve currency and the exorbitant privilege, they're they're able to to print money at will to pay whatever debts they want, uh, and that can be inflated away. Those debts can be inflated away. Uh, but what this also means is that it enables them to support the economies of their allies, and, and that's clearly what they've done. Uh, just a little history. Uh, to, to say that uh, uh, Japan's economy was rebuilt and Germany's economy was rebuilt after World War II with the US funds. Uh, and, and of course, the Soviets were excluded from that. And uh, and then the finger was pointed at them saying that, you know, they don't know how to run their economy. Well, of course, they couldn't because they didn't get access to capital. But uh, and and that was, that's true, of course, of other countries like China, for example. Um, and uh, so what that means is that they support the alliance network through access to the US economy. And so when, when the US economy was strong, or let's say relatively strong, uh, it was able to import at, at will, you know, from Germany, Japan, the UK and everywhere else. And of course, those countries uh, took great advantage of that. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go into the details of the sort of a, a 1971 decision to unpeg to gold, but um, what it meant was that uh, since that time, the United States has had a weakening relative, you know, its economic strength relatively has decreased. Yet the exports from countries like Germany and Japan and Europe generally, and of course, later China, uh, have increased. And so the Americans, uh, of course, need to uh, sustain that to sustain their alliance network. Uh, because if Japan and Germany are not exporting to the US, well, they're going to be a lot less interested in whatever the US wants. So um, to do that, uh, uh, they have they have continued to to print money so that they can import. So these are, these are the, the basis of all their deficits, basically, their import deficits. Uh, and so uh, as, as they've done that, they have also then turned around and said, well, now we have to put limits on the exports. Of their of their allies, so Korea and Japan and Germany and so forth, have all had their exports or sorry uh, exports to the U.S. limited. Uh, Trump was the the most recent example of that, uh, just a few years ago, and you know made a big kerfuffle about you know he was going to destroy the alliance network, etc. And but that's just evidence of what I'm saying, and that is that uh, as the U.S. Uh, its debts increase, its deficits are still increasing, uh, and it has to maintain imports from its allies because otherwise their economies will suffer even more greatly than they are and now what they've done is they've taken away the basis for example of the european economy access to cheap energy uh, and and weaken those economies even further which makes them more reliant on exports but they can't increase their exports into the u.s economy uh, and so uh, and, and you you add china into that mix which is exporting at you know, with very much, well, better technology in EVs, for example, uh, the vast majority of legacy chips and much, much more. Uh, and then you see that this is one of the great reasons or one of the main reasons that the United States is having a, a economic warfare against China is because it's it weakens the American economic position and its ability to maintain the alliance structures through imports from those countries. And then you add on to that that, you know, car manufacturing is the world's largest business, I mean, by far, and, uh, and and everything that goes with that supply chain, so the glass and the plastics and the wheels and the you name it, whatever it is, uh, that that is enormous. And, and of course, fuel as well. Uh, and and uh, so the advent of cheap EVs, and I just I just saw a tweet about 10 minutes ago where uh, BYD is releasing a hybrid car for less than $12,000 that'll do 2,000 kilometers. Now, there's no way that Mercedes and Citroën and Fiat and uh, and uh, Honda and uh, Toyota, et cetera, uh, can compete with that. So that means that the import market in America is also changing, that nobody wants to buy those old cars anymore. And you have to re imagine that, you know, Germany exports 75% of its cars uh, to overseas markets. So yes, in Europe and uh, in Asia, but you know, a lot to America. Uh, and so there's this very strange predicament now where the US uh, is no longer the primary market for exports uh, of its allies. So China is the largest trading partner of all of those allies uh, and offering them goods that are much, much cheaper and undermining that, that in effect <clears throat> undermines their export economies. And they've been cut off from cheap energy as well. And now they're being asked to increase their defense spending. So 
the the key to that is that uh, as they increase their defense spending it's quantitative easing i mean basically you know famously biden said what was it that uh, the 90 billion no the 60 billion we're sending the ukraine 90 percent of it's being spent in america so this is really just subsidizing the american economy through uh, defense expenditure and it explains why uh, it, they need to uh, create tensions in asia and it, it explains why uh, there needs to be you know uh, well propaganda about uh, danger and threats and invasions and so forth because you need to increase your arms sales and you need to solidify your industrial base so uh, this is a no this is a lose lose situation for the americans uh, and it makes one it makes me wonder uh, exactly how far they can really go and and uh, honestly at this point in time uh, i think i'm calling the the two presidential candidates uh the straw man which is biden you know just fall over he can't even walk anymore uh let alone string a sentence together and and the tin man uh, donald trump uh who's going to insist that everybody pay more money he's going to put on more tariffs which is a tax on american taxpayers uh, reduce their efficiencies uh and and it's only going to make their situation worse so i wonder whether uh you know 2008 then the pandemic and this would be, I think, and maybe Kathleen can correct me on this one, but it will be the longest time that there has not been a, a, a crash, a major crash. So 2008, we maybe not, ex not include the pandemic, but 2008 to 2024, that would be the longest time pretty well in modern history that, uh, uh, that a liberal economy like the American economy has not crashed, had a crash. Um, and so that is being really it's on the vapors of 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 the U.S. currency. And uh, when the, the U.S. the U.S. stock market is now at an all time high, uh, it reminds me of 1929 in the worst possible way. Uh, and I wonder whether uh, they can actually get to November. And if they do get to November, what's going to happen after? Uh, and I think this kind of last roll of the dice of NATO in Asia is is really just to spur that spending again. To increase spending and that's why they immediately called for a 2.5 percentage point uh increase and, uh, and then canada turned around and said oh we're not even going to get to two percent until 1930 until uh, 2032 so and i just where are they going to get the money from i mean seriously where they the only way is to print it and uh, this is only going to weaken the position further uh so it's yeah as uh, as hussein said it's it's a bubble uh, and it's going to crash sooner or later. It's inevitable. Uh, and and I, I think I've been waiting for it for five years, but it's still going to, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. The the constraint, it seems to me, is that you can, you can print as much of the liquidity that you want. The problem that's being confronted is the problem of physics and the availability of materials and skilled people to actually do what it is that, the ambition and the printing press wants to do. Yeah, well, in that article you were talking about, I, I referred to that problem, that very problem. So China's pumping out engineers and scientists with advanced degrees at a very large rate uh, to 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 be able to manage and organise their economy. Whereas you find that you know all the brightest people in the United States are going into finance because they think they can make a lot of money very quickly, and they're not building anything anymore. Uh, and I think that's true. You know, the French are exporting their their brains out of their universities. So there's a reverse brain drain going on here in in a real sense. It's not it's not a river yet, but it's definitely heading that way. Uh, uh, you know, the brains are all going. They're going to follow the money, and the money's in Asia. It's Asia that's got sort of collectively a six percent GDP growth, uh, and well, uh, the so-called advanced economies are all in recession. And perhaps that partly explains why the Americans have also been, I guess, very let down by Modi's visit to Russia because there has been some very clear signals made that there were great hopes that India would provide the American economy with a pipeline of young people who would become educated in the STEM areas, for example. Um, SL, any sort of thoughts on that front? Because... Um, you know, I saw it reported recently that, um, you know, in the, in the kerfuffle about um, foreign students in America, that um, that the ambition was for Chinese students to go to America to study the humanities, but for Indian students to go to America to study science, technology and engineering. And 
this seems to be partly a recognition that there is an insufficient pool of capable, well-skilled, well-educated workers to actually deal with these challenges going forward. And they're hoping to actually take them out of India and not send mm. them back. Yeah. I think it will uh, work uh, for a short while, you know, because it's just a uh, Band-Aid on uh, the bleeding American society. It's such a tragedy that the U.S. ranks at the bottom of, you know, uh, the OECD countries in terms of education. It ranks like 32nd in the world for math, reading, and uh, basic stuff. It's so sad. And, you know, uh, right after uh, World, uh, World War II, they got a lot of uh, brilliant minds uh, from Europe, you know, who came to the U.S. and they built everything. Uh, the U.S. even, uh, like, uh, you know, stole the, uh, uh, the semiconductor technology from uh, German scientists. And then they gave themselves uh, the Nobel Prize for uh, the transistors. And uh, then, you know, the last few decades, they were able to live off the uh, fresh pool of educated people from uh, the developing nations who are so eager to work hard and uh, study hard in the U.S. Uh, but that uh, kind of a scheme is going to run out because uh, 10 years from now, the, uh, uh, the situation like in India will be uh, much better. And then a lot of uh, the U.S. educated people and uh, with a job experience, they're going to uh, come back to the uh, uh, to come back to India, and they're going to start their own uh, software companies and uh, semiconductor uh, design companies and all of that. So this uh, sort of uh, the dependency on foreigners to uh, come and do the work. And it's just, you know, uh, uh, Americans don't want to do uh, the hard work. So they get these uh, poor people, you know, like across the uh, Mexico border, but they get uh, the blue collar workers from the border. And then for the white collar workers, they're, you know, they're getting uh, China, India. So what do the Americans do? I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's not a very sustainable solution. So they have to fix their own society. They have to fix their own education and uh, focus on uh, values. You know, uh, people don't, I don't know, you know, people don't like to talk about values for some reason, but it's the most foundation of a, of a society, you know, just like a family. If you want to have a good family, you want to have good values. And the same applies to a uh, society as whole. Well. And in the U.S., uh, but nobody wants to talk about values. It's like a bad word. And uh, and I think they're going to suffer in like uh, about 10, 15 years. There seems to be a real dilemma. A second, Warwick, I just want to make a point yeah. about this. Uh, that This is very much related to the corporatization of education. Uh, because, uh, for example, in Cambodia, what do what what I see in Cambodia is, and this is relates to to what, um, uh, what what's just been said, and that 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 is the 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 gen the 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 fall in general standards in STEM and other other disciplines uh, in education is directly related to the corporatization of education. So government no longer wanted to pay for it because they wanted to reduce government services. So, you know, with Ronald Reagan and all that sort of thing, neoliberalism. Uh, and so then steadily education levels have dropped. Um, and of course, I think France and uh, Germany have uh, resisted that enormously, but the UK, Australia, the US and other countries didn't, and they've dropped in the rankings quite rapidly. Uh, but now uh, they're still very respected for their, you know, high quality education, especially in, especially in, um, in uh, they made a lot of money with foreign students coming and paying very high fees. But now what you see, and this is very true in Cambodia, is that you have all of these foreign universities and in China too, setting up their campuses in those countries. 
So this is kind of like the outsourcing of labor. Do you see what I mean? It's like, it's the same thing as sort of saying, okay, we'll close our factory and we'll, we will get Chinese to make the thing. Uh, well, this is the same idea. We're, we're basically our universities just can't quite operate properly anymore. So we'll just outsource the universities to the market, like directly to the market. And so there you have all these foreign owned and foreign run universities and schools. And in Cambodia, there's an enormous amount of foreign run schools. Uh, but that's training training up the Cambodia and other emerging economies are getting the benefit out of that. But in the meantime, it's 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 stripping the uh, the advanced or you know the the more advanced countries in education. It's stripping them, uh, and it means that students don't want to go and live there anymore. They're they're perfectly happy to come back to China or to Cambodia and 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 make a, make make money here with when where their families are. And it also relates very much to immigration as just labor function. So you know importing labor, and that's uh, you know if you want to maintain a very very high labor or very very low employment, I should say. Uh, then you you have to cut immigration immediately, uh, and so you cut the lowest educated first, and then the the higher educated last. Uh, and and I think I think you can see that that is really what's happening in the world today with education. Yeah, you know, uh, like if you look at say uh, patents, uh, so uh, China became number one a few years ago, and then they were like, yeah, but there's something called. Uh, uh, the WIPO, uh, the international patents. And then uh, China became number one in that as well. And then uh, similarly with the uh, scientific publications. So China became number one in the world in uh, 2016, I believe. And then they're like, yeah, but uh, they're not so very high uh, quality. And then uh, China became uh, number one in at the top, uh, the 10% of the most uh, cited articles. Then they're like, yeah, but the U.S. is still number one in uh, the top 1%. And then China became number one in the top 1% of the most cited articles. And then they were like, no, the Chinese are cheating. Uh, they're just uh, citing each other. And then uh, last year, China became number one in uh, the Nature Index, which is like the most uh, published articles in uh, the top uh, 100 of the most prestigious scientific uh, journals in the world. So it's sort of uh, the copium, uh, whatever China does, uh, the US, uh, the elites and uh, the media, they try uh, to console themselves as to why there's something, you know, there has to be something bad with that and it should not be so great about China, but they're just fooling themselves, you know? Uh, the Australian, I mean, uh, the ASPI think tank, which is all uh, funded by uh, the U.S. Uh, military industrial complex. And they published these, uh, they looked at uh, 44 uh, the most, uh, the critical scientific areas. You know, this is like uh, the AI, uh, quantum computing, blockchain, nanotechnology, and so on. And they said, uh, well, out of those 44, China is leading in 37, you know? And uh, so the US uh, really has uh, to get out of uh, the delusion and uh, they have to fix themselves and they have uh, to accept the uh, multipolar world and not just uh, live in a fantasy of we're the greatest nation, we're the greatest people, everybody loves us, we have democracy, oh my God, we have so amazing country. Come on, give me a break. Pascal, hand up. Yeah, maybe this is where it comes together again because of uh, what the multipolar world actually is. And uh, as L the thing is not that um uh, uh sorry i just need to pin myself here the thing is not that the us must stop saying all of that the thing is that they kid themselves into believing a narrative about the world which they constantly need to fix with just more patches and that doesn't actually change the world it just pisses everybody else off because because you don't give anyone else recognition but the multipolar polarity of the multipolar moment is the fact that 
these changes are happening and that they cannot be stopped. You know, 50 years ago, um, something like India going to, to Russia in a moment like this, uh, the Americans would have tried, would not only have tried, they would have succeeded in stopping that through coercive measures or through, I mean, it's the carrot or the stick. But the carrots are not sweet enough anymore and the stick is just not scary enough anymore. And therefore, these new structures are now emerging. So in a sense, what we have to think about is not how do we bring about the multipolar world, it's um, what, how do we support the multipolar world not decaying into a uh, world war. Um, the, 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 the cooperation between the different players is taking place and we can, we can see that, that the new structures are being built and the economic uh, backbone that is still needed with like uh, settlement mechanisms and so on, they will emerge in one way or another because we have large enough markets of enough players trying to, to build them and one or the other or maybe three or four systems are going to emerge that will uh, take over that uh, that function. The, the, the problematic part is to make the former uh, power that is so used to calling the shots, let it go and let it happen without actually blowing it up. Um, so that to me is, is the question is how do we, um, uh, from all of this hubris the, and the hubris that then is, is, is framed in a way of everybody else is an enemy, how, how <laughs> do we deal with that one and, and assure the Americans that, you know, we still like you, we still want you to be part of the multipolarity, it will be fine, you will, you will, you will be okay, we will um, all work toward you also being uh, uh, one of the kids playing with everybody else, and you don't need to be, uh, you don't need to act like this. And to the Europeans, it's like how to tell them that um, you really need to get a grip, <laughs> as in, as in the, this absolute dependency on the top bully is not good for you. But that doesn't mean you have to to turn or turn around. What I mean, what Orban is doing is he's not trying to to shoot at the Americans or something. He's just trying to mend ties, and that's something we need to support structurally in order to get away from this brinkmanship, um, where especially the West is trying to do it in, in an all or nothing way. But the multipolarity itself will take care of itself. That's why it is multipolarity. David. Uh, yeah, I just want to add one particular aspect to the education since I used to teach at Texas e and both the undergrad and graduate programs. The problem we have in America regarding education is that education is a transactional here in the U.S. It's all about the cost. You look at the elites, the Harvard, the Yales, the uh, Princetons and Stanfords and so forth, let alone the dark side of that. Where the problem uh, uh, institutionally is is that the students are not taught to think because we are when we are in the classroom, you have to now be worried about how the students feel or rather how the students think. It's because the system itself became uh, to the point of, you can have an honest debate. That was one of the reasons why I left Texas Siena because it became clear to me that the institution did not want me to push students to start to think outside the box. And the whole reason for that is to make a point to them that there is a world out there. You need to understand you are not the only one dictating the terms on the global stage anymore. Why? Because the world has changed and we need to change with it. And this is part of where our problem here educationally, this is why we are going down. And American society, it, it, it pains me to see where things are going. It's not going well, I'll admit it because we're not producing qualified sort of uh, thinkers, if I may use the term. And that goes with the territory as to where the world is headed and we are lacking behind. I just wanted to add this one to the conversation. It seems so far that there's a couple of, just from listening to what all of you've been saying, that a multipolar world has a number of important features. In a sense, multipolarity is what it is in that you know, countries are doing their thing. But success within that environment depends upon investing in people and ensuring that a population has 
the skill sets necessary to um, contribute and to make the most of the transformations that are happening. That seems to me to be um, a, a pretty important piece of the infrastructure fabric, if you will. The second thing it seems to me um, related to that is obviously in parallel, the need to develop pathways for industries to develop, real industries that actually do things that people value and need and want as part of improving their lots in life. And when those two things happen, an economy also becomes substantially more autonomous in that it has a core, if you will, that it can rely upon, you know, a population with skills and industries that are delivering useful things at the right prices. Um, you know, that's just that's just an observation that I guess I'm making out of everything that everyone said um, so far. Um, Hussain, any thoughts on that? I mean, you, you've spent your life in economic development, actually. So Yeah, I uh, just wanted to say, uh, if, if this is my concluding uh, statement, is that we need not to globalize NATO. We need to globalize the Belt and Road Initiative. Because as you said, what the world needs is infrastructure, uh, healthcare, education, industries, agriculture, environmental, uh, you know, uh, upgrading. Uh, and, you know, I just was thinking today because in the 1990s, uh, people say, were saying, telling us in the Shiller Institute, we were wishful thinkers because we, I was an activist in the streets here in Stockholm. I was also in Germany. And we were distributing leaflets calling for building the new Silk Road, that we should develop East Germany, Eastern Europe, Russia, and all the way to China, that France, Germany, and the United States should pull their technologies together to develop the world and Africa, industrializing Africa. And actually, it was funny because we produced the first ever uh, comprehensive study of the how the new Silk Road should look like. This was published in 1997. And wow. actually we had a, a blueprint for how it will look like and uh, what kind of projects that are necessary, including nuclear power, magnetic levitation, cranes, dams, space technology, space cooperation on a global scale. And people thought we were a bit crazy uh, because the way Politicians in Europe and the United States were thinking we're completely the other direction. But look at the world today. We do have a new Silk Road. We have the Belt and Road Initiative. We have the BRICS. We have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And all these nations are thinking in these terms. Uh, one of the things that Modi and uh, <laughs> Putin agreed on was to build nuclear power plants, civilian nuclear power plants in Bangladesh. It was not only military uh, cooperation. So scientific, technological, space cooperation, all these things, this is what the world needs. And this is not optimistic talk. This is what China, Russia, India, many other nations are working on. The only ones who are be lagging behind is our countries here in Europe and the United States. And this should be a big concern for us because we are left behind. But at the same time, our leaders are saying, Yo, instead of catching up with the others, we should stop the others from running away uh, and, and developing. And this is what really uh, a terrible uh, situation. And I, I'm still optimistic we can still, and uh, I think this gathering is a good example that we are working for peace. We are still working for peace and economic development. And this is a, a fantastic forum for promoting these ideas. And um, I wanted to ask you a question actually, just thinking about economic development and, um, you mentioned earlier that the Philippines and Japan have reached, uh, have entered into a, what is essentially a defence or a military agreement. Was, has there ever been serious discussions about an economic agreement? Um, well, um, well, if you look right. at the Philippines, I mean, Japan relation, I mean, Japan is one of our biggest aid donor in, in many ways, no? Though, as far as economic is concerned and trade, I think it's still China that is our largest trading partner. But when you talk, I mean, during the previous administration of Duterte, I mean, you can see that most of the talks and most of the agreement with different countries is really towards 
um, economic development and economic prosperity because I think that was the main um, objective or the main um, uh, well, the main track of, of the, the, the previous administration. But in this current administration, that, 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 this is the problem with the Philippines. No? It's, it's a mirror image in many ways of the United States. So if you see the United States as being crazy, I mean, the Philippines is a mirror image of that. And if you really look at the Philippines in Southeast Asian context and even Asian context, it's the only country that has um, inconsistency when you talk about policies, especially even if in foreign policy and economics. So with, with regard to economic development, supposed to be it should be our priority. And we should supposed to be part of the of, 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 of the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and, and, and synchronize our infrastructure development, which is very necessary in our side, both the physical infrastructure and the soft infrastructure. But the, the problem is every now and then there's a change in administration and it depends on the president. And at this time, the current of administration is more focused on and precisely because it's heavily influenced by the United States in many ways, it's more focused on defense and military cooperation with many countries, especially regional powers like Japan, Australia, and even an outside power like the United States. So you can see that instead of trying to capitalize our good relation with China and try to get more um, investment from China um, infrastructure-wise, we have a problem at the moment because... Um, our infrastructure is not moving. We, we don't really have new uh, anything in, in the country at the moment. Our, our uh, in terms of investment coming into the country, uh, especially FDI, 64%, uh, we lose actually around 64% of it. It's not, it, it's, it's gone, something to that effect. So th th there is really a lot of challenges that the country is facing when it comes to economic development. It is precisely because, really, to be very frank, in, in, in the context of Southeast Asia, in the context of Asia Pacific, the Philippines is at the moment being used by, well, the United States at its proxy vis-a-vis -vis China in this whole geopolitical um, competition and, uh, and the assertion of the United States for dominance in the Indo-Pacific region using the South China Sea as the issue and even extended to you know, the, the, the Taiwan Strait issue. So in that context, most of our, well, from my observation, many of the agreements with regional powers or uh, or quote unquote um, with the United States and its allies in, in my country is geared towards defense, security, and military and a little less on economic. But, and also we, we kind of lose the chance and even the opportunity that other Southeast Asian countries, like for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, they get so much from China in terms of investment, in terms of tourism, but we lose that much actually, be, precisely because of the conflict in the South China Sea between China, it's intensifying. And behind that is, you know, the United States really. So it's really odd, you know, if you really look at my country, it's a bit odd that, in Southeast Asia, almost all countries has a very good relation with China and even with Russia and with other regional powers or reg middle powers. But on our side, uh, at this time, I would say this current administration, we really have that our, our relationship with China is deteriorating. We now have Russia, on the other hand, um, we're creating actually an enemy to a greater extent out of Russia precisely because of, you know, Zelensky visited the Philippines and it seems like the current president is, you know, admires Zelensky very much in that sense, which is really crazy. And on the other hand, also um, the deployment of MR MRC or, you know, the mid-range um, missile launcher in the northern part of of the Philippines is also, I think, got the attention of President Putin, and even President Putin pointed out in June 28 that you know we know that you're you have that kind of military assets deployed by the United States in that part of your country, and we took note of that, and you know we are also trying to see, you know, what would happen, and we're also trying to think of where to deploy our military assets in the Asia Pacific to protect their interest. So this is really the crazy want part. want to quickly right interject That's here really about crazy. the importance of that. He took so note of that in the context. Right 
I just want to interject quickly, uh, Anna, sorry. Yeah, Th this sure. was really okay. significant. Yeah. Putin took note of that in the context of talking about nuclear conflict. Yes, yes. I, I, I about would, where I the would, missiles yeah. were. Yeah, so implicitly the Philippines had set itself up as, yes, a, yes. as, as a target. Yeah. yeah, that is actually um, my yeah. article that will be published yeah. actually tomorrow as a, an, an opinion because uh, I'm writing also as a columnist in one of our newspapers, which is one of the biggest, I think, in the country is all about that, that, you know, I mean, it took a Russian president to point out that, you know, we know that you have um, nuclear weapons deployed in, in the country and and it, it took him. This it is extremely disturbing, yeah. To do that. For, for yeah. even us to be aware, because the whole country was not aware. Well, people like me knew from the very start, since it started with the um, Balikatan Earth Exercises with the United States. and But the, the whole, the public is not aware of it. One very important and critical point is the media, really. Western media is way much dominating the whole public opinion thing in the Philippines and also the media really has to play a constructive role in trying to educate the people because usually the Western media, what you hear from them is criticism against Russia, criticism against China, and all of this propaganda, black propaganda against China and Russia. And a country like the Philippines are very heavily influenced by Western values and even Amer very Americanized in that sense. Usually they don't think anymore. And it has something to do also with education, as you have discussed earlier, that you know, education now in my country is also transactional in, in many ways. So people are not thinking, students doesn't know how to think critically, and they cannot even analyze simple things. So that is also a product precisely of, of the kind of education that we have. Our young people does not really think. So what whatever the media says. I mean, the, the 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 people in my country, they just believe, you know, even if it's wrong, even if it's misinformation and disinformation. So the Philippines is at its crossroad, but it's a critical country if you really look at peace and stability of the region. Because if in any case, it will be, it will not wake up and it will be used against China or against Russia to spark something in, in the Asia Pacific region using the South China as the issue or the Taiwan Strait issue, then we will have a problem. That's why... We really have to do something also and try to tell the public opinion in my country because at the end of the day, politicians in my country are elected by the people. So still the people, at the end of the day, it's still the people that has the, uh, the, the power to put people in power and to remove them from, from being there. So that is a very challenging situation right now. Um, for for the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis the region because this is not uh, this is not just a Philippine thing. I believe that everything is well connect interconnected. What happens in one area in one country will affect the whole world and even the immediate region, which is Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. So we are ve uh, people like me are really facing a lot of challenges at the moment and working hard for Filipinos to wake up and for Filipinos to do something, especially we don't want our country to be dragged in a third world war because that is the critical point at the moment. Um, we're afraid that we will be used as a proxy for a war that the United States has been planning for longest time to weaken China because they cannot defeat China. It's a home court. But to a greater extent, it will create a lot of problem. It's the same in Ukraine. Yeah, they will never be able to defeat Russia, but they were thinking before that they can weaken Russia. But look at Russia right now, a higher middle income country as, as per um, the World Bank. But on, on the on the Asia Pacific side, we are uh, Filipinos like myself are quite very afraid that, you know, we will end up in a confrontation with China over the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait precisely because of the American push and using us as a proxy. So that is a huge challenge that I, I think it's not only should be the concern of the Fili of Filipinos like myself, but the concern of the of everyone in the world and even of people who lives in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah. Certainly Thanks, have Alan. a favorable audience to that here. <laughs> but, uh, if I could interject, uh, I, I have to run to something. Um, with um, a multipolar world, there's only two directions. Uh, one is uh, consensus, and the other one is conflict. 
Uh, and the U.S., by providing bombs and everything like that, is clearly aiming towards conflict. Uh, China, by doing economic development and putting forward these principles, is looking at uh, how to build consensus. And this is really the two major directions that are out there. And uh, I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. But we might um, look to wrap up ourselves as well. I mean, it's getting on, certainly. Um down in my part of the world anyway, um, so speaking a little bit selfishly. But um, what you described, Anna, made me think of a, a discussion that Pascal had actually the other day um, about Finland. And um, and I don't want to open another um, uh, vector tonight, but I think that there are some important parallels and lessons to be learned there, to be shared and for people to understand. And uh, And perhaps I could like I did last time, um, throw uh, to Pascal for the last words and perhaps to reflect a little bit about um, what neutrality might mean in this context, um, given the problems and the challenges of it and, um, and, and, and how you sort of might sum up this last, um, let's just say last two weeks of the world. Let me keep this brief, but, you know, a, a lot of what has been said somehow connects to this issue of neutrality and neutrality doesn't is, is not about um, just staying out and staying away. It's doing your own thing. So I think, SL, when you talked about India's position and and uh, actually standing up and saying, like, no, we we have our own way of doing things and we have a right to do our own thing. And that's what your foreign minister does time and again. And he does it brilliantly, brilliantly. Um, but the pressure coming down uh, on the neutrals is the oldest thing in the world. And it is usually the stronger part of a conflict that does that to the neutral because the the weaker part and in this sense russia is the weaker part if we look at uh, the proxy war in ukraine right uh, and one belligerent is basically the nato countries and the other belligerent is russia and it is fought through and uh, through ukraine the weaker one structurally is actually russia and russia has more to win of more states remaining neutral whereas the united states has more to lose from them remaining neutral and has more structural power so it will try to influence everybody uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to actually fall in line, and what we are seeing at the moment is that a lot of countries don't do that. India doesn't do it. So a lot, a large part of Southeast Asia doesn't do it. Africa doesn't. South America doesn't. Now we have a few exceptions. The Philippines is one. The Philippines is falling in line. Although I must say, the Philippines tried for five years under Duterte to. Uh, accommodate with China. And that didn't fly either. So my big question, and maybe we can do this next time, is why is it that China, that that there that, you know, it's not just smaller countries are being bullied by larger ones. And the Philippines still is being bullied at the same time. So there is there is a reciprocal kind of thing going on still. And we need to figure that one out. But the the danger of falling in line is of course that you become the next Ukraine. And I don't think Japan will be dumb enough to do that. But I am afraid that other that uh, that there are other places in which uh, in which political elites are are more integrated with with the United States, where something like that is is possible. Um, I am afraid that uh, Finland and and Sweden uh, have now so completely switched, and that the Europeans are so completely flipped that they would be willing to become the next battleground. Um, so my question to everybody is how do we how do we prevent that? How do we how do we strengthen uh, local resolve not to become a battleground and not to fall in line with anyone, but do your own thing? Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Pascal. And perhaps on that note, um, we can um, wrap up officially and um, and we can have a bit of a chat afterwards as well about um, some of the next steps and and, um, and, and what we can do. 